This one was a lot of fun. It was difficult to find the original makers of Old Quaker. I thoroughly researched some of the earlier distributors hoping to find something there, but somehow I finally found out that the name that I was looking for was the Corning family. So let's start unpacking what we found on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. <laughs> The first thing I came across was a website stating that some Corning brothers were the original makers of Old Quaker, but I learned that it actually started with their dad, Solon. So Solon was born in 1810 in New Hampshire, seemingly settled down in Cleveland, Ohio before marrying Almira when he was 23, and they ended up having five boys and a girl. The records begin in 1850, he's 40 years old. The census shows him as a merchant, which I think he's already in the whiskey business by now because another 1850 census document shows some interesting information about his status. So here's Solon, and it asks how much improved and unimproved acres do you have? Meaning how many acres are being worked? He shows that he owns close to 200 acres, 125 are improved and 67 are unimproved. Cash value of the farm is $7,000. He lists four horses, two milk cows, 40 cattle, and his livestock is valued at $824. Just think about that. We're in 1850. I mean, he's pretty wealthy. Then he reports no wheat or rye, but 3,500 bushels of Indian corn. I've never actually seen one of these records before. Maybe I'm only seeing it because he's a brewery because it seems that it's related to the business. Now, I don't drink, so I'm not educated in things alcohol related, so I looked to see if beer or whiskey had been made with Indian corn back then. And I found an article that said that beer is most often made with barley, which is malted and then brewed with hops before being fermented. Early brewers appear to have found a few substitutes for barley, such as Indian corn. In fact, they say a number of early beers were made with little or no grains. So the company's name is S. Corning and Company. It's not until 1858 that something pops up in the newspaper. This is pretty awesome though. You don't usually see a complete list of what the company is selling and at what price. This is so cool. So they're selling alcoholic items along with burning fluids, which I'm assuming is for their lamps. I'm sure there are plenty of other uses as well. 1860 is when we start seeing some of the boys coming of working age. The oldest boy, Edward, isn't listed here. He's 25, so he's off starting his family. We see George Card as the second oldest, then Warren Holmes, Helen is in the middle, Franklin Tracy, and then finally Charles Solon. They spread out having six kids over 20 years. Edward is 20 years older than Charles. For some reason, in 1863 here, Edward doesn't show as working with his dad, but George and Warren are old enough to work there now. Also notice that it doesn't say S. Corning and Company, but just Corning and Company now. Every year the numbering seems to change for the business, but it stays in the 60s or 70s, River Road. When I pulled that up, it doesn't have a street view, so I got a satellite view. I don't think it's standing anymore. But this area is known as Whiskey Island, and there's a Whiskey Island Drive here. So in 1868, Edward dies at the age of 33. I'm not sure why he died so young. The following year, Solon, the dad, died at age 59 of cancer. The following year in 1870 census, Warren takes his two younger brothers to live with him and his family. Franklin has just come of age to work, and he's now working with Warren at the plant. A couple years later, 1875, the youngest, Charles, is now 20, and he's bookkeeping at Merchants National Bank. It's still just Franklin and Warren at the distillery. In 1878, they have a new partner, J. Lee Newton, joining the team. This says that this image was used for Old Quaker since October 1878. Warren and Franklin then moved the operations from Cleveland, Ohio to Peoria, Illinois in 1880. This 1880 directory also points out that Franklin is the president of Monarch Distilling, which from my understanding is either right next door or right across the street from the main Corning building. 
1882, the youngest brother Charles joins in on the fun. Warren is now president of Monarch, Franklin is vice president, and J. Lee Newton looks like he might have moved to Peoria with them. Eleven years after the move to Peoria, in 1891, Corning and Company is still showing up in the Cleveland directory, so I guess they are running both locations. Now we're coming up to the Whiskey Trust. I'm still not quite exactly sure how all this works, so let me try to explain it the way I'm understanding it. So apparently in the whiskey world, fluctuations in the market caused distilleries to either have too much or too little at any given time. Federal taxes played a role as well. The ones with too much would flood the market, underbidding everyone else out there, causing problems for others. There was a group of distilleries that formed an agreement to not overproduce, but no one really followed this agreement. Then a, quote, trust was put together. This originated in Peoria, Illinois, and the Cornings were part of this whole thing. So what happened was there was a group of trustees elected to run this trust. Companies sold stake to this organization, and the trust ran the group of distilleries as if it was one company. The idea was to regulate the pricing as a whole, so everyone was more on an equal playing field. It went well for a few years. The trust was running about 80% of the market, but like everything else, with power comes corruption. The trust would have the power to just shut down a distillery for whatever reason it deemed. Distilleries that did not want to participate with the trust might get mysteriously burned down. After a while, the trust caused more harm than good. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, making these types of trusts illegal. 1898 is the first ad that I found for specifically Old Quaker. This guy, W.J. Friday, was one of the distributors that I researched for a good hour or more. <laughs> But what I noticed is this guy is in Pennsylvania distributing Old Quaker, so they've branched out. And here's 1900 in Alabama. So in 1899, Warren died. So Franklin is now in charge of operations. October 3rd, 1903. Explosion kills seven. A huge cylinder cooker, 20 feet long and 8 feet wide, exploded through the side of a five-story brick building. Those who were nearby said it was deafening. There were only seven men inside and all of them died. There were many injured, but they were doing activities outside. A couple months later in December, the grain elevator caught fire, causing $50,000 worth of damage. Franklin was quick to rebuild and get going again. The following year, in June 1904, another explosion. This time, 14 men died. It's unknown how it started, but 30,000 barrels of whiskey fueled the blaze. This time, 3,000 cattle were burned to death from the immense heat. This time, the damage was estimated at a million dollars. At the time of this fire, the Corning Building was the second largest distillery in the world, 11 stories, reduced to rubble. The following year, the Cleveland plant maybe got sold off because the paper says the Monarch Distilling name has been changed to Phenomenal Distilling, which makes me think there's a new owner over there. Also in 1905, I see a patent for a new logo for Old Quaker. In 1908, the plant is rebuilt and bigger than ever, and poor Franklin just can't seem to catch a break. This time, the fire started at the top floor of the six-story building. 6,000 people in the area were evacuated from their homes just in case. $750,000 worth of damage, but no one died this time. A few years later, in 1914, a terrible case of hand, foot, and mouth disease spread through town, and it came from some contaminated cattle from Michigan, and the loss of cattle was heavy. They said the disease could take up to a year to cure, so they were being very careful to quarantine the cattle under strict watch with armed guards at every barn at the distilleries around town. Never a dull moment around here. The status of the company at this point is Franklin is president, Henry W. is vice president. Now, Henry Wick is Warren's son. Well, the following year, in 1915, Franklin died at the age of 64. Henry took over as president. 
This 1924 article says that Corning and Company has dissolved and was in the process of distributing the $4 million assets. So I was a little confused to see three years later, Henry is president of Corning Distilling Company. And then I realized Corning and Company was dissolved and the new company name is called Corning Distilling Company. I think with the dissolving of Corning and Company, the old Quaker brand was sold off to a company from New York called Shenley. Shenley picked up several other brands of whiskey and they were able to survive the prohibition. There are many, many ads running all the way through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and the last one I find is 1968, which happens to be the date that Shenley was acquired by another company. And as far as I can tell, that's the end of Old Quaker. So I thought my bottle would be described as a crackle design, but I found that it's called a spiderweb design. The code Federal Law Forbids Sale or Reuse of this bottle went into effect November 1st, 1934, and it had to be embossed prominently on the shoulder of each bottle until 1964. And the mark on the bottom, the G in a diamond, was made by General Glass Company, and they operated for three years, 1935, 36, and 37, before they were acquired by another company. So this five is 1935. By the way, that's the cork that you see there stuck to the bottom. And that's all I've got for today, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.